Hi, this is Governor Pete Ricketts, and welcome to another podcast of the Nebraska Way. I'm very excited to be here today because we have not uh, done one of these podcasts really in about 16 months. So we're picking it back up again from where we were before the pandemic. Obviously, during the pandemic, a lot of things got derailed, including our podcast. We couldn't do them uh, you know, close together because we were doing this whole social distancing thing. And we were kind of busy at the state of Nebraska trying to manage a health emergency anyway. So we didn't have a whole lot of time to record them. But we're very excited to be back. And we've taken the time in the, uh, in the meantime, we're, we've upgraded our technology. So now we're going to do these by video. So we got all this video cool technology. So we've made good use of those 16 months off to look for ways to improve the the production value here, so hopefully you all enjoy this. So welcome again to another uh, episode of the Nebraska Way. We're excited to be back. And today we have a great guest who's going to be joining us here today and really help talk to us a little bit about his experience, which I think you're going to find fascinating. So our guest today is Nathan Law, and he was one of the Hong Kong activists going back to 2014 when Hong Kong was having discussions and dialogue with the Chinese Communist Party about political reform and dialogue. You may recall that Hong Kong is in the transition period going back over to the, the Chinese Communist government after being a colony for the British government for uh, 99 years. And it was promised a number of democratic reforms and democratic protections in a 50-year transition period. And uh, the Chinese government has been eroding those things away in the intervening years. And so Nathan and his colleagues were some of the activists in 2014 who began that dialogue. In fact, uh, he was one of five uh, student activists who was uh, specifically talking to the government about those reforms and having the, those debates about what political reform was gonna look like. Then in 2016, he and uh, his colleagues formed a political party, Democisto, to be able to run for elections, the Legislative Council. And Nathan ran and won in 2016 with 50,818 votes. Do you like that, Nathan, how we got the exact number there? And uh, yeah. we got the exact number of votes. Yeah, so he ran and won, becoming the leg youngest legislative counselor in Hong Kong history. Now, in 2017, then, the Chinese Communist Party overturned that through a reinterpretation of their constitution. And Nathan was then thrown out of office. Uh, he uh, went on to be nominated by both U.S. Congress uh, folks and uh, British parliamentarians for a Nobel Peace Prize. But also in the intervening years, he was uh, jailed for his participation in the Umbrella Movement and being one of the leaders of that going back to 2014. And then with the passage of the uh, really draconian national security law, fled Hong Kong to escape the persecution from the Chinese Communist Party he currently has been exiled or has gone to London, is where he lives in exile, I suppose. He can't go back to Hong Kong, uh, where he continues his activism and really advocating on behalf of the rights for people uh, in Hong Kong to be able to have those democratic institutions. So we're very pleased to, today to be joined by Nathan. And uh, Nathan, uh, I know that there was a number of you who were involved with this. I believe uh, Joshua Wong was another person um, that was nominated for that Nobel Peace Prize, as well as Alex Chow. But... Before we get there and, and kind of your experiences, why don't you take me back and how did you first decide to get involved with the Umbrella Movement and what was that like? And then what was it like in 2014 when you were one of five people who was designated to dialogue with the Chinese government and really debate the political future of Hong Kong? Yeah, thank you so much, Governor Rickerson. Uh, it's my honor to be able to participate in this podcast. Um, it is a fascinating story for me because um, I think my growing up is um, just as similar as the other ordinary working class folks in Hong Kong. So my father swam from mainland China to Hong Kong in late 70s uh, because of uh, economic uh, uh, strain and a lot of political instability in mainland China. So he came to Hong Kong and then I was born in mainland China in 1993. And then I reunion with my father, with my mother in 1999 um, when I finally came to Hong Kong. So it was uh, a, a very difficult time. Um, I grew up in a working class family. My father was a builder. My mother was a street cleaner. I grew up without understanding the uh, politics or anything about activism. Um, I usually 
describe my parents as having refugee mentality, which means that they only um, are focusing on or aware of um, uh, the stability, economic stability, and they struggle to provide food on the table. So they didn't really talk about politics in, in our family uh, family gathering or in daily life. Um, it is not until I was in high school where I was also studying in a pro Beijing school. So I uh, hadn't been talked about um, human rights and democracy for a very, very long period of time while I was studying. Um, on the next day of Liu Xiaobo getting his Nobel Peace Prize, my school's principal, he, uh, she talked uh, badly. He, he, he basically, she basically denounced Liu Xiaobo for, for what he had been doing and saying that he is a bad person um, during the morning assembly. So it really triggered my curiosity. Uh, but then I only knew that people getting a uh, Nobel Prize are the great people in that field. So how come a Chinese Norency being criticized in that fashion? So I look up uh, about what he had been doing and realized that he had been championing democracy in this communist regime and wanted uh, more reform on it. So eventually I, I, I was um, kind of politically awakened by that. It was uh, one of the few incidents that I, I felt myself having the need to understand about the society. So when I get into university, I consider myself as a half an intellect. Um, and I answer the calling of the era, which uh, back in 2014, uh, there was a huge discussion on political reform. And I realized that as a, a university student, as a, um, as a spearhead of uh, social changes, I decided to get involved in student union. And uh, my school student union was part of the Federation of Students, which uh, the Federation uh, became one, one of the two prominent student activist group in the umbrella movement. So that was kind of the time when I was uh, being pushed under the spotlight and then to embark my student activism um, role in this democratic struggle. So how did you get selected to be one of the five folks who was actually dialoguing with the Chinese government about this political reform? Yeah, so it was a remarkable dialogue or negotiation with the government. It was in the middle of the umbrella movement, and I, alongside with other student activists, uh, we were contacted by a middle person uh, who had also connection with the government. And we had come up to a conclusion that we would try to engage in dialogue but eventually, we learned the lesson. Um, dialogue with the Communist Party may just be a method for them to drag and uh, to procrastinate our reaction so that they have more time to prepare for a larger crackdown. I think that nature of the Communist Party um, has been seen by um, a lot of folks in the US polit political scene or some other countries. And uh, there has been a drastic change in how to deal with China not giving them room to, 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 to kind of like engage in meaningless negotiation and for them to get prepared for larger crackdowns. I think um, this, this was, for me, a lesson learned. So is that why you decided to run then for office in 2016 after seeing the Chinese Communist Party just drag its feet, drag things out? You're like, fine, I'm, I'm going to run for office and, and try to make an impact that way? Yeah, in 2016, after I finished my term in the student organizations, I found uh, the party that was sister with Joshua Wong and Anna Chow and the other student leaders. We had uh, a, a, a thought of injecting youth energy into the political scene and also uh, uh, inheriting the umbrella movement spirit from a street protest into a chamber so that we can have uh, both uh, inside the system and outside the system struggle. And we tried to collaborate these two in order to maximize our impact. Very good, so what was that like running for office? What did you have to do to actually get elected? You got over 50,000 votes, so you were successful, but what did you actually have to do? And, and, how did, and what was the government doing to oppose you while you were running? Yeah, so um, it was an underdog journey for me. Um, I remember that a month before the election, we finally come to uh, to welcome the very first pool data about our popularity. Uh, and in Hong Kong, we are adopting a proportional system. So uh, there were 15 teams running for six seats 
in my constituency, which it, it was the wealthiest, most educated, and most aged uh, constituency. Um, by then, I was only having 1% of supporting rates one month before the election. Um, my perception was uh, people that they tend to elect professors, legal scholars, ex-government officials, people they consider them as um, experienced, as a professional, and as people with qualification. So, but then I was still a college student. I was still studying. I was a street protester. So that they may see me as like someone who are not qualified or who are not um, educated enough to be in that position to talk about policies. But throughout um, a few public forum debates uh, aired broadcast by um, TV station, I demonstrate my composure, the ability to talk about policy, the ability to reason, and to have an understanding of how the society looks like, especially for working class folks. Um, I gained the trust of them. Uh, the kind of like inexperienced of my resume became actually an advantage, showing that I'm not changed by my experience. I will do things in a fresh angle, representing people's voice, especially from pe- from from the younger generation. I think those things had had become access for me and gained the trust of the people. So I actually have a I have a um a, a reversing sweep, which I find uh, at the end of the day I was getting second highest vote among those 15 lists and gained the trust of the people. And so how did that happen then that you got elected? Did you Were you able then to actually take office as a counselor? And were you in office for a certain period of time before the Chinese Communist Party kicked you out? Or how did that work? Yeah, so I only served the council for nine months um, bef- before the, the, the Chinese Communist Party me basically came me out of the council. Um, so after I was elected in, in October, we had to take an oath in order to assume office. Um, I took the oath and I followed the council tradition, which I added remarks before and after the oath taking. I quoted Gandhi and saying that I only serve the people instead of the br- uh, brutal regime that kills its people. So I was making my promise to the people who voted for me and demonstrate my political opinion. It had been a council tradition. We have had uh, legislators um, done it before. But um, in November, which is one month after I took the oath, and after the, the, the uh, president of the legislative council approved my oath, the Beijing, uh, Beijing reinsur- uh, issued a reinterpretation on our constitution to add new requirement on uh, the oath taking section. So in the US, for example, the uh, rights of um, interpreting the constitution lies on constitutional courts or in some other regions like Supreme Court. But in Hong Kong, that right lies on the hands of the communist regime. The National People's Congress Standing Committee has the right of Um, basically redefining Hong Kong's constitution. And there are a bunch of people who decide things only by uh, political bias instead of legal expertise. So that on that occasion, uh, they reinterpret our constitution and de facto adding up new requirements into our oath taking and then apply it retrospectively so that my oath was um, seen as invalid uh, with the court. So uh, in July 2017, I was unseated because of the reinterpretation. So it was seen as an outrageous attack on uh, forces' rights because we've got voters, uh, hundreds of thousands of them, because we, we've got six legislators unseated. Their votes, their ballots are being tossed into the trash can. And for us, we're representing their voice and we are being silenced. Uh, because of government's uh, persecution. So it was seen as a massive political persecutions on the people and um, the legislators back then. And so who replaced those six legislators, including you? So we have had um, a a, a by-election after that. um, Some of the seats are regained by the pro-democracy camp, 
and some couldn't uh, because the governments had, had a lot of uh, massive campaign around it and uh, people were just frustrated because if they knew that their votes can be overturned so easily, basically that was a political persecution. So how come they are yeah. charged or they are convinced that uh, they are mobilized to vote and it counts? So there were certain um, uh, 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 worries in, in voters so that the turning out uh, part of it uh, were in favor of the government. Yeah. So now later you were jailed for your participation in the umbrella movement. So talk a little bit about how you came to be a leader in the umbrella movement. And then what was it about that, that you landed you in jail uh, from the Chinese communist party? Yeah. In 2017, August, um, I was sentenced to eight months of jail because of my participation in the peaceful protest in 2014 umbrella movement. Basically, the charge was I called out a uh, protest uh, that was uh, not authorized. And that was a crime that I committed. Um, it was seen as the landmark case because in before an authorized assembly was just fine community service. My uh, verdict in the lower court was a community mm -hmm. service. But the government appealed. And in the court of appeal, they kind of um, uh, intensify the verdict, uh, the sentencing, and they sent me to jail because of that. So um, that was a blow for me because um, you could just imagine in one month, I was kind of degraded from an honorable legislator, quote unquote, to an inmate. And it was emotionally demanding for me. But I learned um, to try to like convince myself that as an activist, I have to sell through all these persecution with a calmed mind, with a normal mind, so that um, I can deal with these uh, challenges um, peacefully. So I, I kind of like, um, yeah, keep myself calm during the present time. And, and luckily, uh, in around two and a half months, I appealed and the sentencing was uh, successfully revoked. Yeah. So now you, this was for something you had done in 2014 when you were part of the umbrella movement. Surely the Chinese Communist Party could have pressed those charges any time at 24, you know, after 2014. Right. I mean, you're going back three years to go after you for this, but they chose to wait until after you were done, uh, after you were, had you know, lost your seat as a legislative counselor to do it. Was this to send a message to punish you and anybody else who would want to do the same sort of thing? Well, um, yes, definitely. I think in Chinese idiom, we have um, we have an idiom saying that um, they fire at the birds that runs the fastest. So it means that when you're so high profile and you are seen as kind of like the prior target of the government, and especially you have gained the trust of the people, you are enjoying international profile they will definitely go after you and hunt you down. So I think that was uh, a message sent by the verdict and the following actions from the government, which, uh, well, they'll kick you out of council, they will put you in jail. Um, that's the way that they uh, deal with dissidents. And so while you were in jail, did they try to put pressure on you to change your views or to renounce the umbrella movement or anything like that? Or did they just basically let you sit in your jail cell for eight, about well, two and a half months till your appeal was done and then you could get out? What was it like being in jail? Yeah, the, gov the Chinese government and the Hong Kong government have been um, manipulating the narrative. They have been trying to stigmatize us as uh, troublemakers or uh, um, initiating color revolution or accuse us of uh, being a spy of the foreign agents. Uh, there were like state media saying that we're trained by CIA. And I was so puzzled because I was uh, like too thin. I was, uh, they're on muscle in my arms. <laughs> uh, they, they were just um, <laughs> using all sorts of uh, 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 really, really nasty tactics to attack you personally and try to frame um, an image of you as uh, kind of a, a person with, with, with no positive positivity, a person who is like being um, uh, uh, incited by 
uh, uh, outside force and to undermine our, our pursuit, our demands, which are genuinely from our bottom of our, from, from the bottom of our hearts, that we fight for democracy, we fight for freedom, we fight for the rights of live from fear. So uh, in, in prison, I have um, listened uh, a lot of these narratives day by day, and it was uh, a, a very um, routine experience. So by putting you in jail, you um, live your day very routinely, and it is to um, kind of get rid of uh, your critical sense because for every day you, you feel and you see the same thing. They wanted to make you feel numb about uh, mm. the world. They want your um, like passion for democracy being cooled down by assigning you to those uh, meaningless chores, repeated work, uh, and, and, and then to, to, to kind of like um, to, to erase your, your your sharpness so that that was what i've been through um luckily i i had adjust my my um mind and to sail through it uh quite peacefully and so you mentioned that your parents were as you said had a refugee mentality stability don't rock the boat what did they think about this when this was all going on and were they allowed to come visit yeah. you in jail <laughs> well um my mother th first learned that I was participating in student movement. Um, it was a funny story uh, when she was in a wedding boutique and she was having fun with her friends, talking, chatting. Suddenly when, when she looked up to the television, she saw her child being arrested on the scene. And that was exactly uh, the arrest that put me on jail in 2014. Um, I lied to my mom about my participation because I don't want she to, to feel worried and, and then to stop me from doing this. But eventually, I, like she knew the fact that I was participating in the most dramatic way that I, that I could have ever imagined. So, so she, she, she was worried, but she was also trying hard to convince me to like, pull me out from this political storm because... Like we, we, we don't really have any background. We're working class family. Um, we, we have been struggling uh, in some of our time when, when we were, um, uh, when I was younger. So she was very worried. Um, but eventually she, she understood that um, there's no way she's going to change me. Um, well, my belief was so keen. And from time to time, she understand um, and the narrative that um, if she's unable to change me, then she she has to understand what I'm doing, and sometimes tactically supporting me. So um, yeah, when I was in jail, she 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 paid visit um, every week. Um, it was not long. Uh, the visit was just thirty minutes, but I just felt like at least there is a family that I could fall back to, um, even though she was so worried. Uh, yeah. Uh, she was a cleaner, and from from time to time, I I I heard about it from my from her friends. She cut her hands just because she was just way too tired and too worried when she was doing the work. But she didn't tell me uh, when I was in jail. So at that time, I I felt a bit of guilty because like family is is important. Family is one of our values, but. I mean, the society or, or no, um, the tyrannies makes you to, to choose between your vocation and your family. And my family expected that I could provide. I couldn't because I invest all my time and commitment to social activism, which is for a larger cause, larger than myself, larger than my family. So it, it was a torturing time, definitely. So you, you obviously had to go through a lot of sacrifice uh, to be a part of the movement, and then while well, you spent time in jail, was there a moment leading up to that where there was something that just happened that you're like, I've got to get involved, I've got to be a part of this movement? That you mentioned it's larger than yourself. Was there some, was there a time? Was there some event that made you say, This is it. This is why I've got to fight for reform in Hong Kong. 
Yeah, so I remember that、um, when I first saw the release of Tear Gas in 2014,、um, of course, on the one hand, I, I, I really observed、uh, how the government deal with peaceful, completely peaceful demonstration. People were shocked that never seen something like that.、Um, but on the other hand, I saw a lot of beauties in humanity. Um, a lot of young people carrying old people out of the scene. Some were using water to rinse the eyes of the others, and same thing repeated during the umbrella movement. And the same thing I also witnessed in 2019 protest, where、um, there were so many occasions that suddenly the the police shot at us without any warning, without any like. Um, um, for us, without any pro- provocative actions, they just did that, and people helped each other. And I found from a frontline young protesters back that he was carrying his last note with him, so he was prepared to went missing or, or or even died on the field because of the fight for democracy. So these are touching scenes. Makes me. To to feel like I'm not alone. I'm with a lot of other peoples, and I will walk with them no matter what. So you mentioned the、uh, protests in 2018, and obviously,、uh, you know, we here in the United States and around the world saw some of those protests. But were there things that the international media got wrong or didn't see, or things that the Chinese government tried to portray that weren't true? I and mean, what did we miss? Here, watching from half a world away, that you saw on the ground there in 2018. Well, I think because of the anonymous nature of the protest,、um, there are lots of、um, faces in the protest that are not seen by the media. Especially, I've、uh, I've in personally interacted with a lot of them who are under 16. They were just child. They were like 15, 14. And they were at the very front. I think we just have to rethink why these people come out, and why they are committing themselves,、uh, even in such a young age. What, what does the protest mean to them? I think that is an important question that we we should ask. Yes, definitely.、Um, the Communist Party was way too brutal in dealing with the protest, and these people knew it, but they. Still, well, protest and face enormous amount of pressure and danger, and that is because freedom for them is something that、uh, they are willing to sacrifice. It's part of them. It's about the dignity,、yeah. and it's about fullness of how they see themselves. And I think that part is important, especially、um, as we all say that、um, sometimes we just feel like in democratic countries. People are just taking freedom for granted. Yeah, they don't really realize how communist party ruin people's life, and they own, they cannot see through all those propaganda from the communist party, and they fantasize the way that they deal with their people. But in fact, it's not. So I think that is something that I think hit very hard、uh, to me, and also、uh, that is the beauty of Hong Kong's story. It echoes to the core values of、uh, our Western audience, of the, the people in the U.S. that we we fight for freedom and we should not take it for granted. Yeah, no, that's really impressive what you said about all these young people saw how oppressive the Chinese Communist Party was in 2014, and yet they still showed up in 2018, even knowing that they were going to face the same sort of oppressive、uh, government that was going to do the same sort of things to the protesters. That that is pretty. Pretty amazing. Now,、uh, China passed a new national security law, and、uh, this was actually after you got nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, first of all, let's go back to that. What was it like getting nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize? Were you aware that that that、uh, politicians in the United States and Britain were going to nominate you? What did, did you know that was going on? What did it feel like when you were nominated? Well,、um, I was in jail, and、um, I was. So that that was the time in the day that、um, the, the the officials will carry letters to you. So receive a letter, and it it is its cover is from the U.S. Congress, and I was puzzled, and I open it, 
and I saw it was a nomination letter composed by a bipartisan congressman. And I was shocked, but I was, um, I was pleased. It, it is not about me. It is not a recognition for myself, but it's a recognition for Hong Kong's people's struggle and they're seen by the world. And we've got bipartisan support in the US, bipartisan support in the UK, and it really shows that um, the, these core fundamental values are still the, the consensus of this country. Uh, there are, these are the very core things that um, people, politicians in democratic countries that they are still agreeing to. And I think okay. it means a lot to me and it means a lot to Hong Kong people. And it really bl- bring a, a glimpse of joy when I was in jail. All right, great. So now, now you get out of jail and uh, the Chinese Communist Party passes this really restrictive national security law. And at this, is, this is the point where you feel like you've got to leave, right? That, it, that yeah. you're just going to end up in jail for much longer. Is that right? And then it, how did you get out? I mean, how did, how did you get out if, it, if you knew that this was going to be a potential problem? Why did the Chinese just let you go? Or did you have to sneak out? I mean, how did that all happen? I felt like the Chinese government made a wrong decision of not blocking me in, at the airport um, just before the implementation of the national security law where um, there were news about it for around two months and the Chinese government was going to impose this law that completely reshaped Hong Kong's landscape um, in just two months without any consultation and legislation process in Hong Kong. They directly imposed this. Um, it was a shock to the society. And when I learned that people's free expression will be stripped off because of the law, I came up to a struggle um, whether I should leave Hong Kong because I believe that we need a phase with recognition, with international profile that could speak up for Hong Kong, free from the national security law. And that is the international advocacy work, awareness raising work that I've been doing. So I, I, I eventually I made the decision of leaving. I remember on that day when I depart my home to the airport, I was having a backpack and a hand carry suitcase. I didn't bring much for me because I knew that it was in rush and I and I couldn't tell my families because I knew that if uh, if they knew that I was leaving, they would be colluding with me and they will be harassed, intimidated, or even arrested by the government just by the fact that they knew that I was leaving. So I didn't talk to them. I, I, I couldn't even say a goodbye to them properly. So I, I carry all those things and I and I just go to the airport. I, I, I didn't know whether I would be stopped. Um, it was a common tactics for uh, authoritarian regimes to block people from leaving a country uh, without any reasons. But I think luckily I, 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 I managed to block the plane and when the plane was taxiing and they, it, it took off and I finally had the last chance of looking back to the city, which Hong Kong's night, night, night sky view was fantastic. Uh, it is famous for its night view, the city landscape, yeah. those lights, those, those tall buildings. That was a... I believe the very last time that I could see that scene in my real eyes in a very, very long time. So I was so emotional. Um, tears were in my eyes. I finally felt the weight of leaving your homeland, uh, perhaps f- for that case or, or even forever. That, those, that, that was the time I, I finally felt the weight of it because I managed to get out. So it was a very emotionally demanding journey and decision to make. But um, I- I'm glad that I can still play my part here by talking to you, Governor, and to other policymakers and to press, to media, to journalists about what's happening in Hong Kong. And I feel like this voice is important so that the world can see Hong Kong. So let's talk about that because I think, sadly, uh, Hong Kongers have not been able to celebrate or commemorate the Tiananmen Square um, uh, you know, protests this year in Victoria Park like they would normally do, uh, again, because the government's blocking them from doing that. What else has changed in Hong Kong since you left? What are the things that you know about that 
the Chinese government has cracked down further on? Yeah, a lot of things changed after the implementation of the national security law. So first of all, our free, free speech is curtailed. Um, there have been more than 100 cases uh, uh, under the national security law. Some of them, they were just chanting slogans, displaying uh, protest material on the street. They were arrested just because of what they said. Um, and also, our uh, uh, media are being threatened. Yesterday, uh, 500 political police raided into Apple Daily's office, which is the second time they do it. And uh, Apple Daily is the most critical and vocal newspaper in Hong Kong that are very uh, that, that are very critical to the Chinese Communist Party. And their offers were raided. Uh, their executives are being arrested. And their owner, Jimmy Lai, uh, is in prison and being charged with the national security law. So it we basically put their hands on independent journalism and uh, a newspaper that dare to criticize, uh, to silence them. So the freedom of uh, uh, press in Hong Kong is extremely threatened. And also there are lots of uh, NGOs uh, are pulling off because of the worries of being prosecuted. Rallies have been banned for more than a year. Uh, there have not been any legal or authorized rally for the past year. So a lot of lives and perspective in, in, in Hong Kong changed because the government implemented a law, but they also transplanted the mindset behind it, which they want to remain a power hegemon. They centralize all power. There is no division of power. Uh, they explicitly say that Judges and courts have to serve uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Civil servants have to serve the Chinese Communist Party. Um, basically, all sectors and the legislature, they have to embrace the leadership of the Communist Party. So that really changed how Hong Kong looked like and how we perceive Hong Kong. And um, it's been a year and a lot of my friends went to jail in this period of time. Um, Joshua Wong, Jimmy Lai, and among many others, I'm just very worried about them. And it, it, it has completely changed um, Hong Kong. So this uh, July will be the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. What do you think the CCP is going to do to try and position itself? How is it gonna try and present itself uh, when they hit this 100th anniversary? Well, they definitely continue their wolf warrior narrative, saying that, oh, the world is um, targeting them. They are so innocent. They're peacemaker. They are not intending to uh, try to export their authoritarianism around the world. Those are the lies. Uh, in fact, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is the party that uh, puts a narrative of going against the world, seeing a lot of democratic countries who have helped them to grow as hostile forces. They have been saying that, well, all protests in Hong Kong are initiated by the US trying to subvert them. They have, a, actually, they are the ones with the Cold, Cold War mentality that's seeing the world as their enemies. And uh, they will continue to do it. They will continue to stigmatize all political demands from Hong Kong people and they will continue to challenge our rule-based international order and of course the interests of the US uh, as they are being seen as the largest enemy of China without their, their explicit, explicitly saying so. So I think uh, the way we react to it is uh, first of all we have to get our perception right. They are the threat towards the democratic community. They are actively promoting authoritarianism worldwide and they are protecting dictatorships with similar mindset so that they could consolidate their ruling. And we have to develop, uh, on the one hand, our understandings to them, but on the other hand, the mechanism to defend ourselves, uh, make sure that the infiltration, the espionage activities in the US and around the, the democratic countries to a minimal level um, so I guess, um, well, we, we need to change our perception before we change our actions. 
And I think that the change of perception has been established in the US. So we just have to act. We need to show um, that our persistence on democracy and freedoms, and by implementing needed policies, we will send a very clear signal that the expansion of communism and also their authoritarianism will be halted by our collective efforts. So next month, I'm going to sign a proclamation declaring July the um, victims of a communist remembrance month. What else can we do in the United States to be able to get the message out? Or what are some things that you've seen that have been particularly effective about just what you're talking about, changing that perception of ma- and getting action? Well, I think that is a fantastic idea. I think there are a lot of work to do to preserve Hong Kong's culture, protest-related artwork, as they are all being banned and censored in Hong Kong. And it, it, it's core to the Das Pra community because we have to let the memory goes on and on. Uh, that That's how we have uh, the, the agency and the empowerment to fight against this brutal regime. We have not forgotten that the Chinese Communist Party is the largest authoritarian power and they're the second largest economy. They are a tough enemy of us, but we just have to go on. So I think preserving culture, encouraging interaction of the US government to Hong Kong community and providing them uh, much needed helps on setting up community center, setting up cultural center so that they can preserve those uh, identity and powerful um, history. I think this is uh, one of the things that I hope uh, we can sustain in the future. So really letting people tell their stories about being victims of communism so that the, the people remember and they use that as motivation, is that fair? Yeah, definitely. Um, stories are powerful and um, it's important that we preserve that. Um, so I think the idea of having the month to commemorating that is a, is a, is a great thing. And I think like the 4th of June massacre is also a big thing. Uh, we just cannot have the vigil in Hong Kong. So it would be a nice idea to have it done in Nebraska. So with the Biden administration, uh, President Biden is really maintaining, it looks like, President Trump's stance toward trade policy and, and even stepped up the um, conversations with regard to human rights. What more can the U.S. do specifically with regard to China? Um, I think that is a certain continuity of China policy from two um, administrations, and I think that is a good thing. Um, I think we should just push more on the scrutiny on um, the Chinese infiltration in, 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 in the U.S. I think it plays a big part of them of uh, silencing uh, overseas Chinese, overseas Hong Kongers from criticizing the Chinese Communist Party. Um, last month, I was uh, a fellow at the Institute of Politics um, of University of Chicago. And when I had a serious, had a talk, um, the organizer received a letter from the CSSA, um, the the, the Chinese Scholars and Students Association, claiming that uh, they should disinvite me because by inviting me to their talk, I'm hurting their feeling. So they're basically trying to um, censor speech in the U.S. and trying to put pressure on the organizers by um, basically threatening them if they do not do so, they will face a lot of adversities uh, in mainland China or their relationship with China will be hampered. So I was shocked because um, I was having a lesson uh, in, in the U.S., and they are trying to um, silence me and, and, and to transplant the way that they uh, silence people in mainland China into the U.S. And I think this is not the sole incidence. They've been doing a lot of things by their organs, by their front organization. Uh, so I think definitely this is something that we should look at. Now, the University of Chicago is famous for allowing that dialogue to go on. I presume that they still allowed you to speak at their uh, conference. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. So the Chinese, they made the right choice. Yeah. I was going to say the CCP made uh, picked the wrong organization to try to say you're hurting my feelings to. Chicago is all about uh, hurting people's feelings by uh, you have to stand up for what you believe in. 
Uh, uh, right, very good. Well, um, you've obviously now you've relocated to London. You're an activist now still, obviously. How has your work changed? You talked about going to, to uh, speak at some of these things. What else are you doing as far as your, yeah. your work to try to promote uh, democratic ideas for Hong Kong? So for now, I focus more on um, international advocacy work, which um, even though I was, uh, it, uh, it had, has been in the pandemic, I traveled to Germany, to Italy, to talk with policymakers. Um, my activism has uh, grown to a level that I am constantly in connection with foreign media, um, inter- in, in, inter- international journalists, uh, policymakers from around the world. I think it, it just made me um, to be able to carry Hong Kong's story to a further corner in the world. Uh, and my work routine completely changed. Um, I don't really have, um, well, a- opportunity to go to the street to talk to people or to send sending like materials. But on the other hand, it, it focuses more in talking with policymakers from around the world and make sure that stories are, are being told. So have you been able to talk to your family back now in Hong Kong? Have you been able to talk to your mom or any of your friends since you've left? Uh, no, I, 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 I'm unable to have direct contact with them because I, I am worried that that may endanger them. Um, it's heartbroken uh, because you just have to separate from them, but you also know that that is the best way to protect them. So Nathan, you've made quite a sacrifice, leaving your homeland, cutting off your ties with your families and friends. Um, do you ever regret the decision to, to pick up this fight? And how do you motivate yourself to keep going forward? Well, yeah, I've encountered a lot, but I've never regret. Because I, I think it is my duty of doing so. Um, I get people's trucks they have high expectation on me and I carry the rates, weights of my fellow Joshua Wong, um, Lester Sham, Joy Dick. They're all in jail now. And I'm the person who have the luxurious freedom to be able to speak freely. So I always see it as my responsibility. And that is also my vocation of um, fighting for an accountable government and a society that people could feel dignity and that is important. So I, I, even though I've committed myself into it, I've never regretted it. And I, I, I feel lucky enough to get the trust and support of the people so that I am empowered and mobilized to continue to do so. Um, even though I'm in the UK, but I will definitely try my best to pave my way home. Well, Nathan, you're uh, quite a hero. We're getting to the end of uh, almost an hour here now. Is there anything else that you want to touch upon? I mean, we, did, we forgot to mention, for example, I think in 2020, Time named you one of the most 100 influential people in the world. Uh, but is there anything else you want to hit upon before we kind of wrap up here? Well, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a very in-depth podcast. And I, and I really do hope that um, well, my existence and my efficacy could really raise the awareness of Hong Kong and also China's human rights violation. And we can work together to craft a more democratic globe. So uh, here at the Nebraska Way, you know, you can follow me on Facebook, on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter at at GovRickets. Uh, You can send an email to me at pete.ricketts at nebraska.gov. How can people follow you, Nathan? How, if they want to keep up with what you're doing, how can they uh, find out about the activities you've got, the speaking you're doing, your other contacts with policymakers and foreign uh, you know, press and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I've also got my Twitter account, Nathan Law Casey, and my Instagram and my Facebook, but uh, mostly for Facebook and Instagram, they are, uh, they are Chinese content. So mostly I, uh, the English content uh, are focusing on Twitter. So definitely you can follow it and to see whether it interests you. All right. Well, great. Hey, well, Nathan, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time here to tell us your story. And it is an important story of what is going on in Hong Kong and the fight to have some of the things, as you mentioned earlier, the things we take for granted here in the United States, 
with regard to our freedoms, you know, the freedom to assemble, the freedom of speech, all of that, we just assume that we'll always have that. And I think that what you're talking about is that's not true around the world. And frankly, it's not true in the United States if we let it go. We've got to constantly be fighting for it here in the United States as well. So thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. And then again, thank you again to all of our uh, listeners and now viewers for the Nebraska Way. We really appreciate you you're taking the time and spending us. And uh, Nathan, I just want to say, wish you the best of luck in all your endeavors. And I hope we get the chance to meet in person one of these days. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you too, Governor. Paid for by Pete Ricketts for Governor, 1610 N Street, Suite 100, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68508.